we left off in Revelation chapter 16, talking about the battle of Armageddon. So that's what we're going to focus on entirely tonight. We're going to talk about the end times as it relates to this climatic battle that happens uh, at the end of the age, known as the battle of Armageddon. So, so let's uh, pray first, and then we will dive into Revelation chapter 16. Let's pray. Lord, it is good to be in your house. In fact, your word even tells us, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. It is, it's good to be here. It's good to just put aside all the other things that clutter our time and our minds and to focus on you and to just draw near to you. So we pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts tonight through your word and that you would minister to us however we need you this evening. Some are here joyful, some are here um, heavy hearted, and some are here somewhere in between. And we just bring ourselves to you, Lord. We just uh, offer ourselves to you and uh, pray that you would do your good work in our hearts tonight. So uh, be glorified now as we study your word together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right, I always wanna review our timeline with you so that we can get up to speed. And for those of you who might be with us for the first time, this is a timeline of the book of Revelation. We are focused right in the middle of the timeline right now, the seven years of tribulation, which is detailed for us between chapter six and 18, which is obviously where we are in chapter 16 tonight, where God has predicted that there will come upon the earth a seven year period of time, unlike any other period of time, where there will be cataclysmic events and natural disasters and things never seen or experienced or heard before, all because God is going to give a final a wake-up call to a Christ-forsaken, God-rejecting world. And so it, it's some very, very heavy stuff that we read between chapter 6 and 18, just all of the disaster and the death and everything that comes upon the earth. So we have to continually remind ourselves, you know, why would a loving God uh, initiate such um, wrath upon the earth, and again, it's because this is the final call for all who would come to know him, and, um, and sometimes those who are at the very end of all of this, who have not up to this point made a decision for Christ, need a louder megaphone. Can anybody relate to that? Right? And th this is God's megaphone at the end of the age to wake people up, and he's going to use these very difficult and disastrous events to try to awaken people. And there will be many who come to Christ. Unfortunately, we're going to see at the end of chapter 16, there will also be many who blaspheme God and they just get angry, which is typical of human reaction. Whenever there is adversity in our lives, we have the opportunity to either run to God or get mad at God. And I'm sure probably to some degree, we've all done a little bit of both, uh, depending on what the adversity was. But the intent behind this is that the adversity would press people to run to God. But just as is typical with us in human nature, we'll see at the end of chapter 16, uh, some will run to God and others will get mad at God and they will blaspheme him. So um, the tribulation period is uh, revealed to us in scripture through a series of three events. The seven seals that are broken, we've talked about that. The seven trumpets that are blown, we've talked about that. We are um, near the end of the third section, which is seven bowls that are poured out. Uh, we are now at, at bowl number six and bowl number seven tonight. And in chapter 15, verse seven, it tells us the, um, it, what begins, what precipitates these uh, pouring out of the bowls, which reveals another series of God's judgments. And it tells us this in chapter 15, verse seven. Then one of the four living creatures, we're talking about angels, uh, gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So four living creatures give to seven assigned angels each a bowl and then they pour out these bowls. And as they pour out these bowls in, in succession, the pouring out of the bowls uh, initiates another um, series of God's judgments. And these are the last of the series of God's judgments. So we're going to get out of the tribulation here soon, and we're going to get to the return of Christ by chapter 19. And if he comes before we get to chapter 19, that's even better. <laughs> but then what we see happening through chapter 6 
are these bowls. I'm going to run through these real quickly to get to bowl number six, which is where we left off. The first bowl, ugly and painful sores break out on all who have the mark of the beast. The second bowl is the sea turns into blood. Every living thing in the sea dies. The third bowl is poured out and the rivers and streams become blood. Drinking water is polluted. The fourth bowl is poured out. People are scorched by the intense heat of the sun. The fifth bowl is poured out. Darkness covers the kingdom of the beast. That's the Antichrist. And then we come to the sixth bowl, which is where we left off last time. The Euphrates River dries up. Demons entice kings of the east to wage war against Israel in the valley of Megiddo. And that brings us to the battle of Armageddon, which happens uh, there, the gathering of the forces in the valley of Megiddo. Now, I do want to get into the text with you tonight, and I will, but I first want to show you a 12-minute video that was actually produced by a friend of mine who lives in Israel. I met uh, Amir Safati about 15 years ago. He actually has spoken at our church, uh, but in the old building. I haven't gotten him here yet. I thought I was going to get him here in March, and he's going to be speaking in Brazil, but oh la la. Anyway, um, but um, Amir is um, a, a Jewish believer who lives in Israel. He is um, a tour guide. That's how I first met him. He led one of my tours. And um, and so I've developed a friendship with him over the years. He has a ministry called Behold Israel. Uh, He is a major in the IDF, in the reserves. Um, He is um, um, eloquent. He is proficient in um, four languages. He speaks, I can barely speak one. Uh, but he speaks four languages fluently. And so, um, and, and as a Jewish believer, he, um, you know, he, he has his Jewish identity, but he believes in Jesus as Messiah, so he understands um, all of the scriptures, not just the Old Testament, but he also believes and embraces the New Testament. So he put together a 12-minute um, video about Armageddon. I'm going to show this to you because I want to take you there. Now, some of you have been with me to Israel, we stop on what's called Tel Megiddo. A Tel just means a mound that has been built upon by successive civilizations. And um, and so we go to Megiddo and we stand and we look over and the Valley of Megiddo, which is the Jezreel Valley. And so those of you who have been there, you're gonna be reminded of these things, but for many of you who have not, I wanted to take you there. And Amir produced and he narrates that he's in it. Um, this short little video clip about Armageddon, because he lives right there by the Valley of Jezreel. So take a look at your screens. I'll come back up. We'll finish out chapter 16 tonight, but I wanted to take you to the Valley of Megiddo. Armageddon. In our collective perception, it is one of the strongest and probably the most dramatic symbol of the end of the world. But for me, Armageddon is not an abstract concept. It is my reality. I literally live on the edge of Armageddon. This is my house. And this is Armageddon. I'm always fascinated to see how fast the symbol of Armageddon populates our collective mind and triggers our survival instinct. The term Armageddon is a scary term, and if you want to describe something catastrophic, something that might extinct humanity, something that might bring an end to the world as we know, that's the term you're using. Sometimes financial Armageddon, sometimes spiritual Armageddon. Hey, Ariel. Hey, Abba. Armageddon, more than a place, it is a concept. Get <sighs> you some coffee. Yeah, I'd love some. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. you. There you Thank go. You. Yeah. So, Ariel. Tell me something, after all your very extensive uh, training as a combat soldier in the Israeli army, and all that you have in your mind, uh, 
What do you think the most important skills should be for the soldiers that will come to Armageddon? Well, it depends. I mean, what is Armageddon? How do you define it? Ariel is right. Just like the wise proverb says, where there is no vision, the people perish. We need to have a clear vision of what Armageddon is. Maybe its past will help us better understand our future. We just entered into the vicinity of the Valley of Armageddon, the Jezreel Valley. All the way from the left to the right, this beautiful flat area, roughly 150 square miles. This whole valley has mountains around it, but also little passes that allow access from nearly all directions. And that is, by the way, why this valley was so desired throughout the course of the years. Anyone who controlled this valley literally controlled the trade of the entire ancient Near East. And that is exactly why almost every ancient city that we found here had at least 15 layers of settlement. 15 different times it was destroyed and built and destroyed and rebuilt. Um, simply because as long as the roads were important, there was a necessity for the city to exist. I would say that we all, or at least those of us who are concerned about the future, in one way or another, are seeking to discover God. Each one of us chooses his own path, whether it is science or philosophy, self-discovery, religion or faith, we all are looking for the answer to one simple truth. How can we survive and ensure our existence? And it is not a rhetorical question. For many generations, the concept of Armageddon was the basis and motivating factor for many scientific discoveries, which included academic, social, and theological research. Countless hours of work have been invested in the attempt to understand how to adapt to the times of tribulation. Wow. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah, look at it. All of the, this is bold barley. It's, it's not usually like this? Well, listen, we've got the best winter ever. Everything is so green, so lush, so amazing. I mean, I've never seen Israel so green and so colorful and, and you know, really? flowers everywhere. Even on the banks of the Dead Sea, you find flowers. Wow. It's quite amazing. That's fair. You know the funny thing, Ariel? It's so quiet and so tranquil and beautiful and it almost feels like it's the calm before the storm. We live in days right now that our history is being written as we speak, you know. It's gonna be worse then. Well, the circumstances that will lead to the event right here will be far worse than what we see today. Really? Peter is mentioned 12 times in the Old Testament and only once in the New Testament. But this single reference changed its meaning forever. Right behind us, this is the reason for the name of this whole place. Armageddon. Armageddon. Armageddon is the Greek for the Hebrew Har Megiddo, the mound oh. of Megiddo. This is not a natural hill. This is a pile of debris of at least 20 different cities that built and destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed. Wow. And I'm talking about King David. When he came to this place, he was the 16th layer. You know, Jesus grew up in Nazareth. This is really, literally five miles away from here. Yeah. And it's funny because we like to think about Jesus's time as an ancient time, but Jesus, already could visit this place as a tourist. 
because it was already in ruins at his time. That's how old this place is. Napoleon was here in 1799, and he looked down and he said, this is the most perfect place to gather armies from all over the world. Look at how vast this valley is. I don't think there is a valley elsewhere around the world that experienced so many battles. Especially after the book of Revelation was written, every king and every ruler wished to be the hero who won the greatest battle at the end of the world. And I have a problem with that because it is not entirely correct. I'm gonna take you all the way to the book of Revelation, which is the only book where the word Armageddon appears. In the book of Revelation, where? In chapter 16, and they gather them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. This is the perception of people. This is what they're afraid of. This is what they, they make movies on and then and write books on and they think this is the end of the world. But in reality, this is just the gathering place, not more than that. If you will fly up above and look at Israel as a full body, what would be the most important and the most essential part of it? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Yes. And looking at the Bible, you read that the final and the most existential battle of Israel is the battle about its heart. And it is not the actual site of Armageddon. And yes, in the past, there were so many battles here. And yes, in the past, there was a great mourning and supplication here. But the future is about Jerusalem. The battle will be in Jerusalem. And the mourning in Jerusalem will remind people of the mourning and the crying here. that used to be right here. Even in the book of Revelation, when he speaks of Armageddon, a couple verses later, the camera moves all the way to Jerusalem. The book of Joel says, I will gather together all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and then I will enter into judgment with them there. Let the nations be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. The valley of Jehoshaphat is today's Kidron Valley, and the meaning of Jehoshaphat is God will judge. Definitely a place of judgment. You asked me earlier this uh, morning, what is Armageddon? Armageddon is all in the minds of people. So many people today, they live in fear and anxiety because they think this is it. There's going to be a war in Armageddon. The end is there. The end is here. But in reality, what they need to look for, hope for, pray to, and follow is God and not symbols of great heroic stories of survival. I love my children very much. And if the conversation about the end of the world brings so much heaviness to my heart, I can only imagine how hard it is for Ariel. I wish him to be happy, but I also have to give him tools to deal with hardship and to reveal him the biggest secret that holds us all together, I would tell him this. Faith in God is not something forced on you. It is your choice. True faith is not merely giving yourself to religious laws or ancient story tales. True faith is an essential God-given practical instrument in your toolbox of life. It helps us to focus on what's really important. Calling on God is what defines our truest humanity. Because if God is our final answer, our survival and well-being depends on Him. That was good, huh? 
just gave you an idea of the just taking you there. But let's look together now at Revelation 16. I want you to notice with me, when we go to Revelation 16, we go to the back of our Bibles. Did you notice when he was reading from Revelation 16, he was reading from the front? You understand why though, right? Because in English, we read from left to right, but in Hebrew, they read from right to left. So when they open up to the book of Genesis, they open up back here. <laughs> And then they go, they're reading this direction. So Revelation chapter 16, look with me at verse 12 to 16. It says, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now, the, the dragon is Satan, the beast is Antichrist, and then you have the false prophet here. This is the, this is the terrible uh, three here. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather. Now, notice that. That's key. To gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Jesus then speaks, verse 15, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered, there's the word again, they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Now, um, just some quick background on the word itself. As Amir said in the video, the word Megiddo appears 12 times in the Old Testament, but only appears once, and even then it's veiled. Uh, in the New Testament, because the word Megiddo is found in the word Armageddon. Only one time that word Armageddon is mentioned anywhere in the entire Bible. We have a lot of fascination and um, we, we have a lot of thoughts about what Armageddon might be like, but it only appears one time in the entire Bible. It's right here in Revelation 16, 16, and it is from the words Har Megiddo. And Har Megiddo means hill of Megiddo, and it literally means hill of slaughter. That's what Megiddo means. Har means hill, Megiddo means slaughter, and it is situated along the Jezreel Valley. It is the gathering place for the final world battle against Israel and the God of Israel. And he pointed out in the video that it is the place where these nations assemble. Because what happens is when these demons are uh, released, they entice kings from the east to come and to attack Israel. And it's more than just attacking Israel, it's attacking the God of Israel. And, um, you know, this is anti-Semitism at its worst. It, it, is, it is demonic inspired warfare where these nations will converge against Israel. And the Euphrates River is dried up, it tells us here as part of our text, and that enables these armies from the east. We're talking about Pakistan, um, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Iran, Iraq, and then further east in the far east, China, Japan, Korea, coming across the Euphrates River, which is now dried up, which formed a natural barrier, otherwise, to attack Israel. And so this is what goes down in, in Armageddon, but it's just the gathering place. The warfare doesn't take place necessarily at Megiddo. It is the gathering place for these armies, and then they will end up marching down towards Jerusalem. And so what starts in the valley of Megiddo ends at the Kidron Valley in Jerusalem. Back in chapter 14, verse, 10, uh, verse 20, it talks about how the blood of the battle will, will rise up to the, the horse's bridles. So the Kidron Valley becomes the bloodbath. And as Amir pointed out in the video, Kidron Valley is also known as the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat in Hebrew translates the valley where Yahweh shall judge. Jehoshaphat's name means God shall judge. So the valley of uh, Jehoshaphat, Emech Jehoshaphat, means the valley where Yahweh shall judge. So these nations which gather at Megiddo, which is about 57 miles from Jerusalem, end up marching down the Jezreel Valley, uh, merging over into the Kidron Valley or the Valley of Jehoshaphat, and the battle transpires primarily there in Jerusalem. So that's what he meant when he said, you know, in the minds of a lot of people, there's this terrible battle that happens in, in uh, Armageddon there at Megiddo. 
but it, it seems to indicate from the text that that's just the gathering place. That's why I, I emphasize the word twice here. It's not necessarily where the battle itself happens, but it's the gathering place of these, of these armies that come against Israel and, and uh, the, the God of Israel. Uh, you don't need to turn there. I'm going to read it before you can get there. But Zechariah, if you're taking notes, Zechariah chapter 14, Zechariah the prophet sees this day as well. And he writes this in the first four verses of chapter 14. This is Zechariah 14, 1 through 4. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city and then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, this is Zechariah seeing the return of Christ. Listen, this is Zechariah 14, 4. And in that day, his feet, that is Messiah, Jesus, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west. There's going to be a great earthquake making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. So even Zechariah sees it in his day as the Lord shows him what is going to transpire there in the valley of Jehoshaphat or the Kidron uh, Valley. Now, there is a, a great um, debate and discussion about how Ezekiel 38 fits with Revelation 16. If you're not familiar with Ezekiel 38, I'm going to read uh, first six verses, and I, and I want to try to uh, sew these two passages together here to help us understand what might be going on. But in Ezekiel chapter 38, Ezekiel has a vision of a, a, a major battle against Israel as well. Is this Armageddon that he's writing about, or is it something different? This is what Ezekiel 38, 1 to 6 says. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws. And lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togarma from the far north and all its troops, many people are with you. And Ezekiel writes here, and he goes on in chapter 38 and into chapter 39, talking about these various nations that come against Israel in the last days. Gog is a title. It is not a location. Gog can also be translated prince or czar. And in this particular case here, um, Gog is the prince over uh, Magog. Now, uh, Josephus, Pliny, and Herodotus, those ancient historians, all said that Magog was the land of the ancient Scythians. The Scythians lived north of the Black and Caspian Seas. So we're talking Russia. Russia will, be, will take the lead in advancing against Israel. And these other nations that I just read there will join with Russia. It speaks here about Persia. Persia is the ancient term for Iran. In fact, uh, Persia, up until 1935, Iran was called Persia. And uh, in, uh, before, 19, before the Islamic Revolution of 1979, Iran was actually an ally to Israel. Iran would sell oil to Israel. Now, of course, Iran is a staunch enemy of Israel and wants its destruction. And we also see playing out in world events that Russia has an alliance with Iran like never before. And so we're seeing some biblical prophecies starting to unfold even before our eyes. And, um, and so Ezekiel speaks here about Russia taking the lead, Persia or Iran with Russia. It also mentions here Ethiopia. Uh, and Ethiopia is what Ethiopia is today. And the population of Ethiopia is 45% Sunni Muslim. Also Libya is with Russia. Um, they have a Sunni Muslim population of 97%. 
And so Libya represents the Islamic states of the Upper Nile region of Africa. Also listed in Ezekiel 38 is Gomer, that's Eastern Europe area of Germany and Poland. It mentions Togarma, that's the region of Turkey and Armenia and Georgia. All those Eastern European nations and to the north of Israel, um, Russia, Moscow is like due north of Jerusalem. They begin to converge against Israel and then God steps in. And in Ezekiel 38, it, it speaks about how God speaks in to judge those nations who advance against uh, Israel. And I wanna to read to you the judgment because it sounds very similar to what we're gonna read in chapter 16. Now listen to Ezekiel 38, this is verses 18 to 23. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down. The steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. And thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, I want you to compare that with Revelation 16. If you have your Bible still open there to Revelation 16, Look at verses 16 through the end of the chapter. This is Revelation 16, again, verse 16. says, And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. And then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. That's 100 pounds. One single hailstone, 100 pounds. Men blasphemed God. This is what I referred to earlier. Instead of running to God, men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. I want you to take a look at the screen here for a moment because I've drawn up a contrast here, or a comparison probably is a better term, of God's judgment of the nations that fight against Israel in both Ezekiel 38 and Revelation 16. And there's some great similarities. In Ezekiel 38, it speaks about God's wrath, the word that is used also in Revelation 16. In Ezekiel 38, when God judges those armies, it talks about a great earthquake. In Revelation 16, it mentions a great earthquake. In Ezekiel 38, God talks about how mountains shall be thrown down. In Revelation 16, he talks about the mountains were not found. In Ezekiel 38, he talks about pestilence. In Revelation 16, he talks about plague. In Ezekiel 38, he talks about great hailstones. And also in Revelation 16, it mentions great hailstones as well. Why, why do I draw this comparison? Because it is possible that what we're looking at between Ezekiel 38 and Revelation 16 are not necessarily two distinct wars, but it could be one long military campaign that culminates with Armageddon in the Valley of Jehoshaphat there outside of Jerusalem. In other words, when some people ask me, is Ezekiel 38 Armageddon or not? My answer is yes and no. Well, is it Revelation 16 Armageddon or not? Yes and no. In other words, what transpires over the course of seven years of tribulation, it appears that Ezekiel 38 are armies that form primarily from the west of Israel, in Europe and to the north in Russia and the northern African coast. Those nations come from the west, whereas Revelation 16 speaks about nations that come from the east. 
So what starts at the beginning of tribulation period, which is what Ezekiel 38 seems to indicate, it starts at the beginning of the tribulation, culminates, escalates, is joined by other armies from the east that then make up this ultimate battle of Armageddon in Revelation chapter 16. In other words, I don't know that we need to, you know, debate about is Ezekiel 38 Armageddon or are these two distinct things? Is one military campaign completely finished and then another one begins? The whole thing could merge together in the same way that what begins at Megiddo ends up down at the Kidron Valley. So what might begin at the beginning of the tribulation could culminate at the end of the tribulation with the battle of Armageddon. If you go back here now to chapter 16, look at verse 15, where Jesus says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Notice that in your Bibles, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. It's interesting that the second coming of Jesus, in relation to both the rapture, when he comes only in the clouds to gather his church first, and in relation to his second coming when he actually comes back to the earth and defeats these armies at the end of the Battle of Armageddon, are both referred to as things that happen like a thief in the night. The, the idea here is that it happens secretively that at the rapture. That's 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 to 4. It says this, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, believers, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. We need to be ready. You know, when a thief breaks into a home, the thief doesn't announce himself in advance. So people are caught off guard. But the idea is that when Jesus comes for the church to take the church from the earth and he comes in the clouds, it'll be like a thief to everybody else because it happens in a way that they're unprepared for. But it shouldn't happen in that way for us as believers. We should not be unprepared. We should be ready. We should be prepared. But he returns in a way that is secretive in that sense where other people are caught off guard who aren't prepared for this. And then the idea is also the comparison with him coming like a thief is that it's going to happen suddenly. His return is going to happen suddenly. 2 Peter 3, 10 to 12 says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be? And then Peter answers the question in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. So he comes like a thief, but we should not be caught off guard because we should be ready. And then it leads into verse 17 through the end of the chapter, which is the seventh bowl. And the seventh bowl, and this is the finality of the tribulation that will come upon the earth. The seventh bowl, in summary, is a severe earthquake splits Jerusalem into three parts. That's what we read there a moment ago. There's a great earthquake, verse 18. The topography of the earth changes, and 100-pound hailstones fall upon people. That will leave a mark, I guarantee you. You're going to have some serious uh, insurance claims on your vehicles for that. It speaks there in verse 19 about the great city. And there's debate between that and the rest of verse 19, which mentions and great Babylon, wondering whether or not this great city is the same as Babylon or not. And I land in the, um, in the argument that the great city mentioned there in verse 19 is none other than Jerusalem. And that Jer Jer because all of this happens here at the end in Jerusalem, the earthquake happens there in Jerusalem. We just read that in Zechariah also, where the topography of the land changes. The Mount of Olives is split. Half of it moves to the north, half of it moves to the south. Ezekiel will tell us later that a freshwater river emerges because of the earthquake from underneath the Temple Mount. And it will then run down this new valley that's been created by the earthquake moving these mountains. And that freshwater stream will go all the way down south to the Dead Sea. It'll run into the Dead Sea and it will make the Dead Sea fresh water, if you can believe it or not. An amazing thing that the Bible tells us will happen. 
and, and it will be teeming with life. I, I always make this joke that if you want to get ahead on the market, you know, if you want to get, you know, ahead of things, open up right now a bait and tackle shop down by the Dead Sea. Of course, I don't think we'll be there to actually, you know, be in the store to run it, but it's going to make a lot of money. People will laugh, but uh, it's eventually the Dead Sea going to be teeming with life. And so this is what uh, chapter 17 ends, uh, rather chapter 16 ends by telling us, verse 20, then every island fled away and the mountains were not found and great hail from heaven fell upon men and hailstone about the weight of a talent, again, about a hundred pounds. And, but the sad last sentence of chapter 16, men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. And so I just want to end by, again, reminding us from Ezekiel 33, 11. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? God gives us multiple chances. I'm thankful for the many, many chances the Lord has given me over my life. There comes a day of reckoning, though, and there are no more chances. So while there's still time, turn to Him. Turn to Him and live and enjoy the benefits of walking in a relationship with Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, as we think about this ultimate battle that is going to be happening on the earth and how you will return and put an end to that battle, we think about how we just don't know how much time we have. These things will happen. How soon will they happen? How much time do we have, Lord? I pray that if there's anyone who has not made a decision to trust you, if they're if they're walking in a way that is disobedient to you, Lord, then they're only inviting their own consequences. But you have made a way for us through the sacrifice of your son Jesus on a cross that we don't have to suffer for our sins, that we can be forgiven, that we can be right with you, that we can have all these precious promises of your word bestowed upon us freely as a gift that you would give to us, all because by faith we trust you as our Lord and Savior. So tonight, Lord, I pray for anyone who doesn't know you in a personal way, that they would surrender their life to you, that they would pray a simple prayer to, to begin that journey, just a prayer that just says, Lord, I, I confess that I'm a sinner. I invite you into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I want a relationship with you. I receive you by faith as my personal Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that folks would pray that prayer, that they would confess their sins to you, acknowledge their need for you, Jesus, and invite you into their lives because you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You love us so much you gave your life as a sacrifice for our sins. So we love you, Lord, and we thank you. And we know that your heart is you want none to perish, but all to come to repentance. May we be ready, Lord. May we be ready in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen.